Let's get back to Sports and Torts with David Spada and Elliot Harris on TalkZone.com. On the phone, we have someone who has uh, some Illinois connections. He's a pro football Hall of Famer. He played for the Browns and Redskins. Bobby Mitchell. How you doing, Mr. Mitchell? How you doing, guys? Good. We do our show out of uh, Chicago, and I see that you went to University of Illinois. I mean, and you grew up in Hot Springs, Arkansas. How do you go from Arkansas to Illinois? <laughs> it was the times. Uh, doing my, uh, this was in the 50s. And uh, uh, I couldn't go to the University of Arkansas, so uh, I had to come east. Quite a few of us did that. You, you look at the Southwest Conference at that time or the Southeastern Conference at that time, and African Americans weren't on any of those teams. The, the yeah. Big Ten had a, had a long history going way back. How did you decide to go, say, east instead of west? Well, I really didn't have much to do with it. My mother... We had, we had a church in my hometown, and uh, my mother knew him. And uh, he had been, he's an Illinois graduate. I didn't even know any of this, although I was around it. Uh, and uh, he and the freshman coach at the university at the time had been roommates at Illinois. So they had been following me all along. So uh, when uh, everything opened up, uh, east and west, because I went from uh, five scholarships to something like 36 when everything opened in 54. So that's what happened. Uh, a lot of the schools opened up for blacks. And uh, so they, they directed me on to Illinois. I tell you the truth, I wanted to go to Grambling with Eddie Robinson. Did Grambling recruit you at all? Oh, yeah. That's, all the black schools recruited me. And uh, none of the white schools recruited me. But as I said, that in 54, when the new school decision uh, and a lot of schools opened up for blacks, uh, that's when I got all of my scholarships at the last minute, a lot of offers. And But uh, my family had already decided I was going to Illinois, and I didn't even know where it was. <laughs> so where is that? <laughs> because I'd never been out of the South. I didn't know anything. So that's how it happened. I ended up there, not because I wanted that or they had pursued me or whatever. It really was word of mouth, and uh, and they were giving me an opportunity, so I took it. But I, I was I was virtually uh, controlled on that by my mama because uh, I personally was going to Gremlin. You ever wonder if things might have turned out different, or you think they would have turned out the same if had you gone uh, and played Freddie Robinson at Gremlin? Well, the one thing I often talk about, good, I did go to the University of Illinois because I don't think I could have made the Grambling football team. They had so many great football players because since the guys couldn't go to white schools, they were just stacked up at these black schools. Uh, you couldn't get into Florida A&M and Jackson State, Tennessee State. They had so many great athletes. So I don't know what would have happened if I'd gone to Grambling. Of course, me and Eddie Robinson laughed about it for years. It, it, you know, <laughs> you, you you would have enjoyed yourself, and he, he got off from me, and we we he fuss at me. But he had some great players, super super players, and I, so I don't know what would happen. The Big Ten had some great players too, and my wife just texted me some sad news that Alex Karras just passed away. You probably had a lot of battles with him when he was in Indiana. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a. Uh, a lot of situations at that time, uh, there were a lot of, uh, well, let me go back again. Coming out of Arkansas at that time was another example because all of us coming out that year, uh, the, the, the big time players all went east. And uh, uh, my best rival and friend from Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, Jim Pace, went to Michigan. And he was all American at Michigan. He was all everything up there. Another one of our guys from Little Rock went to Wisconsin. And he probably was the first black quarterback out there, Sidney Williams. And uh, Michigan State got Smitty and uh, different guys uh, just went all over the country and all did quite well. They all uh, 
got great honors in their careers and the whole works. So uh, I, I've always thought that I was the one that had the least chance of being a star because I didn't think I was on the level of those guys. But it worked out pretty good. Well, what was it like when the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, came down? Did it, did it affect you while you were still in high school? No, that didn't. It didn't affect me because I was I was out of the South by then. I came out at the same time it happened, so I was not. It didn't affect me in terms of high school uh, because I was out because so much of it happened right there around us. A lot of the kids were kids I knew, but I'd already left. At Grambling, they had four Pro Football Hall of Famers play there, and Willie Davis, Buck Buchanan, Willie Brown, and Charlie Joyner. You would have been the fifth. <laughs> yeah, those are good friends of mine, too. They all came out real well. Willie Davis and I played together at Cleveland uh, for a year, and then he went on to Green Bay. And... uh Later on, uh, Willie Brown and I, if uh, Val Davis had pulled it off, I'd been over at uh, Oakland with uh, Willie Davis, uh, I mean with uh, Willie Brown. But, uh, yeah, we had some some great guys that come out of there, and uh, there was uh, tons of other guys who did well in pro football. Uh, They had none of them in the Hall of Fame, but uh, several of them uh, certainly was good enough to get into the Hall. So we had some great kids come out of Arkansas. And you had a couple of at least fairly good teammates at Illinois, Abe Woodson and uh, Ray Nitschke. Yeah, Ray Ray Nitschke and I were freshmen at Illinois. Abe was a year ahead of us, and uh, Abe and I have been friends for years and years and years. Uh, he went to the 49ers and got hurt, so he didn't have a he didn't get a chance to complete his pro career, but uh, he certainly shook up the league as a return specialist uh, when he first came into pro football. And uh, Abe was a great hurdler and a runner, so he, he handled it very well. He did a great job. Then you get drafted by the Browns. You're going to be thinking to yourself, okay, the Browns have the greatest uh, running back in the NFL in Jim Brown. Where am I going to play probably? Because you had Brown there at running back, and then you play what, running back, receiver, you did it all. Were you kind of worried thinking to yourself, I'm going to get lost with Cleveland? Well, you know, the strange thing about it, I didn't know anything about pro football. I didn't, I had never even watched a pro football game. And all the time I was at Illinois, I never thought about pro football because I wasn't that good a player at Illinois. And uh, uh, Nitschke wasn't either. You know, all of us just came along at the last minute. But uh, uh, I knew nothing about pro ball. I knew nothing about the Cleveland Browns. And uh, I was not contacted about pro football until the season was just about over my senior year. And that's when a scout approached me and told me that uh, Paul Brown or the Browns were interested in me and wanted to know if I was interested. And uh, and I'm, I'm sort of like, uh, interested in what? <laughs> because I, I, I hadn't even watched pro football. I think I watched one game, and that was because J.C. Carolina had come back to the Bears, and uh, even though he was playing defense and special teams, and I wanted to watch him because I got to know him my rookie, my freshman year in Illinois, and uh, that was the only reason why I watched that one game, but I honestly had not even watched pro football, it wasn't on my mind, I had, it wasn't a part of my thoughts for later or anything like that. In fact, I didn't think I could even play, I didn't think I was good enough. To, to go any further with my football career because I had become so enthralled with with the track and I was enjoying my track career in Illinois. And I was personally forgetting about football. And one, let me say this. One of the things that always disturbed me is that uh, once I became a great player is that I didn't give it to the University of Illinois. That the coaches there never got that from me because I never cared that much about it. I, I cared about track. And uh, I just said, I wonder if I could have could have done that for them. I had a, a great uh, sophomore year, the last half of the season when I got a chance to play, 
and I played. I had three or four or five real great games my sophomore year. I got got hurt my junior year, and then my by my senior year I'm running real well at track and didn't care. So it was kind of a crazy, crazy, crazy career college wise. So I wish now that I had turned it on for them because we could have used it. We didn't win very many games. No, I mean, your coach at Illinois was very really elegant. He had won a national championship in uh, 1951. You were coming in after they had gone 1-8 and eight in 1954. So that, that program had its high highs and its low lows. Yeah, I know J.C. Did, and Mickey Bates had a, J.C. and Mickey Bates had, had a, a real good year. and uh, So that was some of the... That was about the high point for them. But my whole time there, we never, we never did that great. Uh, uh, we went, we went five, six games. We had a good season. Did and you, I just think we were better than that, but a lot of us didn't play well enough, I guess. The college all-star game had to help you, though, when you guys beat the NFL champion Detroit Lions there because you were the MVP of that game and they had to get you a lot of exposure. Yeah, you know, what happened was I, uh, uh, the senior bowl that year, I thought I might get a chance to go to the senior bowl because it had, they, they selected Nitschke and I think, uh, 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 another fl- uh, receiver from the, from Illinois. But, uh, no blacks could play in the senior bowl that year. So I couldn't go to that. But uh, later on, I found out that when I got a notice that the, that they wanted me to come to the East-West Shrine game in, in San Francisco, but that was Paul Brown. He had gotten his friend who was coaching it to, to invite me so he could get a look at me. And I, I went out and I had a darn good game. I was shocked myself. Then, when I got back to school, I found out that Paul Brown had also called Otto Graham, who, who is now the coach of the college All-Star team, and asked him if he found a slot to see if he could get me into the game. He wanted to look at me further. And that's how I got invited to those two games. I wouldn't have, because I, I didn't get invited to anything. And uh, so that's how I got into it, and... Uh, the running back guy at Notre Dame had got hurt his knee uh, that year. Do you know who I'm talking about? Would it have been Paul Horning? No, no, no. At Notre Dame, uh, he's a black guy. Went on to be vice president at Kennedy and all that. I can't call his name. But he got his knee hurt because he was, he was the one selected for the All-Star game. And uh, because he got hurt, uh, Otto put me in his spot for Paul Brown. And that's how I got into that game also. And uh, I had never been outside as a receiver. They put me outside. Uh, and I broke it and went on and had a tremendous game. And uh, uh, So that started my career. And you were a seventh round draft pick. Of course, that's when the league was much smaller. You were the number eight yeah, player chosen. So that would be about third round today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was what was your expectation heading into training camp with the Browns? Oh, everything was. I was in a fog. Uh, as I said, I knew nothing about nothing, and I was just being pushed along uh, by people saying, "I'll go here, do that, do this is this." Paul Brown sent me a contract. I decided it. We just kept moving, you know. And uh, But after I had that game, the very next day I had to report to training camp with the Browns. And uh, it was the strangest feeling to walk in that dressing room at training camp. And by then I had gotten some names like, you know, uh, Lou Groza, Jim Brown, and all these people. And mm-hmm. uh, to walk in that locker room and looking around, uh, my eyes just running around the room, and I'm, looking, I'm actually looking at these guys that I've been hearing about. And uh, and I'm saying, what am I doing here? I'm, you know, this is 
this is the Cleveland Browns, the greatest guys. And it was really a real shock for me. And uh, what am I doing here? And although I had that great game, it hadn't done on me that I could play with these guys. Did they put you in the same backfield with Jim Brown right away, or did you have to earn your way into the lineup? No, I, I had to. I had to earn my way in training camp because they had a lot of good uh, running backs there when I got there. And uh, I'm the rookie, and they had a lot of veteran guys because back then, you know, because there wasn't very many teams, all these teams had guys stacked up at positions waiting for an opportunity. And a lot of them had already played for two and three and four years, five years. So you're up against a veteran player and uh, trying to get a slot. And I was just like a little kid. I didn't know what was going on. I was just running around. And what settled me down was Paul Brown put me in the same locker with Jim Brown. And I didn't think I had the rights to be in that locker with Jim Brown. But... uh, they, they accepted me, and uh, what saved me again was my speed. Uh, they didn't have anybody on the team could run with, like me, speed-wise. I mean, they had the great players, but and I think mm-hmm. they were really dazzled with my speed. That helped me. What was Jim Brown like as a teammate? Well, for me, he was super because uh, he kept me grounded, and uh, he was the man. And I just followed his lead. Uh, we were running, running mates, and we were running buddies off the field. And and uh, for four years, we virtually lived together. So uh, we were very close. So I don't understand. If you have running backs like you and Jim Brown in the same backfield, why does Paul Brown trade you to the Redskins? It never made sense to me. Well, he, uh, Green Bay, nobody was able to beat Green Bay. They had two big running backs, Warner and Taylor. This is me now. And uh, Paul Brown was always bothered by that because he always felt that he had Jim, but I was too small to go up in the middle and all that, which wasn't true. But he felt that if he, and that's because he felt like that, he didn't run me in the middle that much. I had to get my yardage outside, but uh, uh, I, I think that had a lot to do with it. And coming out of school that year was it was a young man who was big and built like Jim Brown, and uh, had some of Jim's speed. His name was Ernie Davis. I don't know if you heard his name. Yeah. And uh, I think he felt felt that. Uh, he would go with that. The Redskins had that first pick that year. They they would get Ernie, and Ernie didn't want to go there because of the situation. No blacks there, so uh, it all worked out for Paul in that sense. So he made the deal with the Red, Redskins. Uh, since they had to take a black, I guess they decided that uh, I'd be a good one to have because I beat them two or three times. And uh, so they, they, uh, the, the deal was made that Ernie Davis would go to the Browns and the pick, would, I would go to the Redskins, uh, along with some other people, and uh, that's where it went. And I don't know if you know the story, the story, uh, the story uh, uh, Ernie Davis uh, got leukemia that summer, and of course never got a chance to play. And I really think the young man could do it. I really think he would have been a great player. Because he, he well, was from the same college as Jim Brown. He was from Syracuse, won yes, a Heisman Trophy. That's right. They're both Syracuse guys. Syracuse had some great runners in those years. And I really think this kid would have been a great runner. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So you go to the Washington Redskins. They'd never had an African-American player. What was that like? You know, being the the first in a franchise in, and in an area where you, you hadn't had a black player on the team, and uh, what were the challenges of all that? Well, what I went through was I wouldn't want for anyone. Uh, 
And I and I don't think I think that if I had gone to the Redskins straight uh, first out of college, that uh, there's a chance I wouldn't have never made it because I couldn't have mentally handled all the things away from the game. It was a pretty tough town at that time. So many places you couldn't go, so many things you couldn't do. Uh, but because I had already been in the league four years. I was, I was a seasoned veteran. I had been virtually raised by Jim Brown, so I had stronger mind, uh, so I could withstand a lot of the things that was going on. But I don't think I, I would have been able to make it if I had came fresh from college. And I think Ernie Davis was smart by refusing to go because I don't know if he would have been able to handle all the other things. Uh, uh, away from football. Uh, but I had had four years, and that helped me because I was able to ward off things, fight off things, uh, disregard things, protect my family, uh, and uh, it's pretty nasty at times. But the players were great. Uh, but everybody around us wasn't. And... Uh, so it was a pretty tough time. When did the Redskin fans start to accept you as a football player? Well, when I, I made all pro the first year. <laughs> and they didn't have that will do it. <laughs> <laughs> and and they got blacks coming into the stadium, which what none was before. So it all it, it, Marshall got financially better and uh the team was better. Uh, the, the rah 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 was better. Everything just went top, top side. All of that helped uh, in terms of the Redskins. Uh, the only thing was that uh, the black guys uh, had a little tough time. Did you ever have any dealings with uh, George Preston Marshall, the, the owner of the Redskins? No, not really. Uh, people wonder about uh, because of his reputation uh, what it was like, but. Really didn't have that much input with him other than when I first met him and we talked and finally agreed on a contract. And uh, after that, I really didn't see him that much. Uh, I'd see him once in a while being the owner, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, players don't spend that much time around owners. Uh well, today they do a little more because everybody's the blister hounds. But uh, back then, you didn't see owners that much. Uh, you, you know, the coaches didn't want them around anyway because uh, they wanted to control their players right. and their, their team. So uh, so I never had that much interaction with, with, with George Prince Marshall. I, I was like everybody else. I was hearing about him, and I'd see him, <laughs> and he'd speak, you know. But mm -hmm. I didn't really have much act with So you go from a running back who got 200 some yards in the game with the Browns to basically an all-pro receiver with 1,300 and some yards. I mean, in your first year, that had to be absolutely amazing because you had to learn a whole new position. Yeah, I, uh, when I, when I had been in the service when I was traded. And, uh, and back then, the draft was in December. So... Uh, I was in service when all, everything went down, and I didn't know anything about anything, really. It was all, uh, I, it was being told to me I didn't know anything. But uh, uh, when when I arrived, when I got out of the service uh, just before training camp, uh, that was the last year that the Redskins trained in California. George Press Marshall always went out to hang with the movie stars during the summer. So he'd take the team out on the train, and they'd train at Occidental College. But that was also the last year that they trained at Occidental College. And uh, so I went out there to hook up with the team. And I remember as soon as I got there, because I was a little late, uh, coming from the military, uh... Bill McPeak, who was the head coach, and I walked up the hill to the to the uh, football field practice, 
And when we got up there, there was nobody up there. And it was shocked me because the Paul Brown's team, you better be up there 30 minutes ahead of him. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. No players was up there. He was probably five minutes before training camp, before, before the practice was supposed to start. So that shocked me right away. And right away, I said, that's why they didn't win with one game last year. But uh, he and I was talking, standing up there waiting on the players. And he said, Bobby, he said, you know, I don't have a great uh, offensive line. He said, I got a good quarterback in Norm Sneed. said, uh, what do you think about, uh, I'm sure he and the coaches has talked about this, uh, but he said, what do you think about going outside as a receiver? Well, I'd never been a receiver, so knowing that he didn't have a good offensive line, I didn't want to get killed either. I said, yeah, I tried. <laughs> and that's that's basically how it happened. That uh, from day one, we started, I went outside, and, and the crazy thing about it, we didn't even have a receiver coach. So I basically was coaching it myself. Uh, and uh, did a pretty good job for, for me to I, make I, all pro, right? Yeah. Uh, but I coached myself that year. and uh, But it took us, another fortunate thing was, back then, we did six preseason games. So I needed all six of those games to get used to Snead, Snead to get used to me because we were, we were training ourselves, you know. And uh, fortunately, by the last preseason game, we began to find each other. And it was just before the season, so we went on and had a real real good year. And then in 1967, the coach is Otto Graham, and he decides to move you back to halfback, move Charlie Taylor to wide receiver. How come they couldn't have had both you and Charlie, receive, Charlie Taylor as receivers? Well, what, what happened was... Uh, uh, Otto Graham always felt I was his best runner because he knew me from the Browns, you know. Mm-hmm. And he didn't like he didn't like not being able to use me in the backfield. And whatever he'd bring it up, I'd refuse it. And so what he'd do is wait till the game start, and then he'd send in a play for me to go to the backfield. Well, every time he'd do that, I'd always break it. I'd either bring it for a touchdown or for a very long run. So this is really playing right in his hands, that he is right, that I'm his best running back. But I've gotten used to being outside as a receiver. I'm liking it, and I don't want to go back in the backfield. And the guy that I watched all the time, Lenny Moore, who went from runner to receiver and back to runner, he got his kneecap up. And, I, you know, I'm thinking about this. As soon as he went back in the backfield, I didn't want to get hurt like that during my career. But he insisted on it, and so I had to run in the backfield song, then I play outside song. Uh, Charlie Taylor, uh, <laughs> we tried to harness his speed and quickness, and uh, uh, he he was too fast for the, the linemen. And he didn't know how to adjust to it. So it was better for him to go outside where he could go on and turn her loose. And of course, he went on as one of the greatest receivers. But now those were some of the things that happened at Colston. And then Lombardi comes in as coach and wanted to move you back to receiver. You had a, your head had to be spinning. Who was, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everybody, uh, no one can make up their mind where I should be. And then I would. I was returning punts and kicks, and uh, so all of this, just I was too versatile. It, it, it bothered people that, in terms of where do they want to go. Uh, in fact, reporters had talked to me about what took me so long to get into the hall was my, all my votes was being split up. X number of reporters wanted me as a runner, X as a receiver, others wanted me as a special teamer. And finally, they agreed that, hey, let's combine it all. And when they did, I went right into the hall. So I was getting hurt by the fact that I was too versatile. What was it like when you found out that you were to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame? 
Well, uh, it uh, uh, when your name comes up, you excite it, but then it takes nine years <laughs> after you've been introduced as a, a Hall of Fame possibility, and that's what happened in my case. So it's year after year of being disappointed, which, as you know, today is happening to so many guys. Right. And you're on that list each year, and you never can get in. You get close, but never in. And each year that you don't get in, there's some great players coming up. Then you were an executive with the Redskins for 40 years, and they had to be a thrill when the Redskins won that Super Bowl with Doug Williams as the quarterback. Well, that was a thrill. That was a real, real thrill to, to, to have that to happen because uh, uh, Doug, Doug had been through a lot of stuff, too. And uh, to, for him to get his chance to prove that he can do all these things was really, really something. And uh, I was just like a maniac in the, st- in the stands during the game, running and screaming and jumping. I know they said, who is that fool? <laughs> Because I'd been down so the first half, the way they beat us. Uh, Denver was, hell, man, they were tearing us up. And, uh, boy, to come back and all of a sudden just go off on them. Uh, it was a great, great thrill for us. Do you look at NFL offenses nowadays and say, you know, if they had this back in the day when I was playing, I could have really put up some numbers. Well, running today... It's just as tough as it was back when we, we, were, we were runners. Where it is different is in the receiving, and the, and the league has turned into a passing league. Uh, just the thought that I could I can run five, six, seven yards, nobody can bother me, is unheard of. And that, that's the difference. And I'm, I keep saying how many passes could I have caught if nobody could put their hands on me? And as you know, during our time, from the time that ball is snapped, the defensive back is beating you up. And it does make a difference in how many balls you get. So that that, that was the one thing that uh, that uh, I felt the difference. If there would have been a difference. Uh, certainly for me, Running wouldn't have been the same. Running is the same. Uh, just a matter of getting to the hole and, 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 and breaking away. But uh, receiving would have been a difference. I just wish you would have got the opportunity to be a general manager with the Redskins because I think they would have been even more successful with you as the GM. Well, you know, when, you, when you're ahead of your time, you can't be bitter about something like that. I never was bitter about that. I knew all along that it wasn't going to happen, even though I knew Mr. Cook respected me very much. He he called on me too too many times to do things that he would normally ask other people in the hierarchy to do. So I knew he respected me and he respected my my brain power, the whole works. But he was no different than most of the owners in the league at that time. Who wants to be the first to make that move? And uh, so I, I never expected that to happen. And it really didn't bother me. It bothered the people more than it did me. Uh, it bothered people in the organization more than it did me. It's something that I didn't have to be, because uh, I learned that as assistant general manager, I have all the powers that I needed. And that does it for another edition of Sports and Torts with David Spada and Elliot Harris on TalkZone.com. Maybe next week we'll have David back in studio and a beautiful female. Thank you to our guests, Vin Scully and Bobby Mitchell, and to our executive producer, Dave Olson. Tune in again next time to Sports and Torts on TalkZone.com. Talk Zone.